All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our service of worship on the 11th of October. It's really hard to believe it's that late in the year already. Um, I haven't decided if this year is crawling by or flying by or a combination of both, but here we are. Um, I know that we have a number of announcements and that Emma got creative this year, this, this week. So without further ado, Kim, can you advance the slide? Welcome, welcome. And Kim, would you like to explain the next couple of slides? Um, well, I did see that Emily's on, so I don't know if you want to unmute. Oh, okay, me. Emily. Slide and kill me for putting your picture up, but. You're, I got to unmute. There you go, you're unmuted. Okay, great, thanks. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm having some trouble with my computer and Zoom keeps disappearing off of the screen, so I wasn't able to see anybody <laughs> for a little bit. Um, but anyways, yes, um, I'm going to be doing um, a fundraiser for our church. Um, I am a, uh, a consultant with Beauty Counter Cosmetics, and um, I was trying to think about a way that I could help um, to raise some money for the church. Uh, we have uh, clean products for the whole family, uh, men, women, children. Um, and we just came out with um, some holiday gift sets and other things. So starting on October the 22nd, um, we're going to have, um, I'm gonna have a virtual party on Facebook. Um, I know not everyone is on Facebook. However, um, I will put my, in the chat, I will put um, the link to my website. Um, and if you make a purchase between now and the end of October, um, and just let me know that, you know, it's for the church, I'll make sure to include it along with our event. Um, but what I'm going to be doing is donating uh, my commissions, which is 25% of all sales to uh, the church. So I hope that you will be able to join us. Um, we've got a lot of beautiful products, um, a lot of things that would make somebody feel very special at the holidays, um, a lot of ways to take good care of yourself. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to do it. Um, and I, um, happy to answer questions. I look forward to seeing you guys um, there and over on the, um, the virtual event. And Emily, I would imagine that this is the kind of thing that we can invite friends to participate Absolutely. in as well. Yes. So um, probably later today, I'm going to go ahead and set up the page and then I'll start inviting people. I'm not connected with everybody on Facebook, um, but uh, please feel free to add um, anyone that you would like to, um, near or far. Um, and um, yeah, because the more uh, the more sales we make, then the more I can donate to uh, to our church. So um, yeah, it should be exciting. Thank you. Yep. All right. Okay. Fundraiser item number two. Um, so I, I announced this last week and it was in the newsletter. Um, we are going to try doing an online auction um, instead of doing a fair, um, since that is a good socially distanced way to do it. At this point, I'm looking for items for the auction. So um, it's obviously going to be a much more limited amount of items. So I'm really looking for things that could kind of do a starting bid of at least $25. Um, any kind of thing that you have that you're willing to donate would be great, whether it's um, an actual item, brand new or even used, if it's a valuable used item, um, services, um, I don't know, some kind of baked goods and wh whatever, as long as it's, it, you think that someone is going to be interested in it, that would be great. I'm trying to figure out the whole thing as I go, but you know, anybody who was around it during that time would know that um, the first year I uh, kind of coordinated the fair was the first year I worked at the fair. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty used to just starting, just jumping right in with both feet. Why not? Um, in addition, um, Andrea Kelsey has um, decided that she wants to still put on the cookie walk to keep things 
feeling of that little bit of normalcy. So they are going to do that. She's going to be looking for folks to bake cookies um, to put them out there and probably some folks to help out with that to kind of tie these two together. Um, what we're going to plan to do is have um, auction kind of pickup day at the church be on Saturday, November 21st, which would normally be fair day and the cookie walk on the same day um, so that it's a small kind of socially distanced one way uh, masked event um, that's still kind of celebrating the holiday and still kind of honoring fair day a little bit. Great. That is all. Wonderful. So now let us take a deep breath and center ourselves for worship. I pulled this text from a hymn that's actually in our hymnal. It goes to the same tune as in Christ, there is no East or West. And when I realized that I couldn't sing the alto part with these words, I decided not to torture the choir by asking them to do it either. But I love the word so much that I decided it would make a good prayer. So let us pray together. Dear Christ, uplifted from the earth, your arms stretched out above through every culture, every birth to draw an answering love. Still east and west, your love extends and always near and far. You call and claim us as your friends and love us as we are. Where age and gender, class and race divide us to our shame, you see a person and a face, a neighbor with a name. May we accept it as we are, yet called in grace to grow, reach out to others near and far, your healing love to show. Amen.
A long time ago, in a land far, far away, God had brought the sons of Jacob to Egypt to protect them in a time of hunger, and they became honored, wealthy members of society in Egypt. Generations passed. Their great-grandchildren had first become poor servants of Pharaoh. Their great-great-grandchildren, still God's beloved as much as the sons of Jacob, were enslaved and forced to work until they dropped, building for Pharaoh's glory in the hot sun of Egypt. Even worse, because the Israelites were strong and healthy people, they were able to have many children. Pharaoh was afraid that there would soon be more Israelites than Egyptians, so he ordered something horrible, that all the boys born to Israelite women be killed. Thankfully, the midwives, women who helped deliver babies, were strong and brave. Led by Shipra and Pua, the midwives defied Pharaoh and saved the babies. God blessed Shipra and Pua, just like God kept blessing the Israelite women with baby boys and baby girls. Pharaoh again ordered all of the boys to be killed. A baby boy was born to a faithful couple. The mother of the baby hid him for three months until she couldn't hide him anymore. She put the baby in a basket and set the basket in the Nile River. The boy's sister watched Pharaoh's daughter take the basket out of the river. Soon the boy's mother became a part of Pharaoh's household and took care of him as he grew up. The boy's name was Moses. He grew up watching the Israelites work for Pharaoh and saw how badly the Israelites were treated. One day, Moses saw an overseer beating an Israelite. He killed the Egyptian man while no one was looking, and he hid the body in the sand. The next day, Moses tried to stop two Israelites who were fighting, but they accused him of wanting to kill them, like he had killed the Egyptian overseer. Moses ran away to a land called Midian, where he married Zipporah and had a son. Moses became a shepherd, and this is where we find him now. Oh, wow, that bush is a flame. It's, it's, it's burning, but it's, it's not burning up. Moses! I've never seen anything like it. Moses! Who is that? You are standing on sacred ground. Remove those sandals from off thy feet, for you are upon sacred ground. Moses, I am the God of Moses' father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. <gasps> Moses, I have heard the misery of our people and the cry of those in Egypt, and I will now deliver them away from the Egyptians to a land that is good and flowing with milk and honey. Moses, you will be that person who will lead the people out of Egypt to that promised land. Me? I shall go to the Pharaoh and say to him, release the Israelites? I, 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 I could never do that. Moses, you will take with you the elders of Israel. And before so, you will let them know that you will be delivering the people out of Egypt. 
Who am I to be doing that? It is I who commands you. Who are you? I am... I am the God known as Jehovah. To who? Jehovah. 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 Huh? I am also known as Yahweh. Yeah, yeah, Yahoo? No, that's not for another 2,000 years. Oh. You obviously are having a tough time. You may refer to me as God. That's a lot easier. Why didn't you say that in the first place? Moses! Oh, sorry. Moses, you are to go to the Pharaoh and demand the Pharaoh to let our people go. Why would the Pharaoh listen to me? Nobody listens to me. To Pharaoh, my wife never listens to me. The kids never listen to me. They're going to look at me and say, this is fake news. Moses, I will be with you to help you deliver the people out of Egypt. But if they do not respect your authority, we shall give them some tasks for them to observe, to witness the authority I have given unto you. Such as? Moses, what is that in your hand? This is my favorite staff. Cast it upon the ground. Okay. <gasps> Holy me! It's a snake! Moses, grab that snake from the tail. Yeah? Behold, my staff. the snake has become a staff in your hand. I like the old one better. Moses, if they don't recognize that sign of my ability, thrust your hand into your cloak. Behold. Yuck, why they? Put that hand into your cloak again and take it out. Behold, it is as it was before. My dermatologist should see this. Moses, if they don't believe the sign, the first sign, they will believe the second sign. But if they need further evidence, when you're with Pharaoh, you shall take a cup and take the water from the River Nile and pour it before the Pharaoh for it shall become blood. Oh, that'll go over big. Moses, you're to go forth to set our people go so they may be delivered to the land of milk and honey. I have appointed you and I will be with you. Why, you know I don't speak so well. I never spoke well. I am not a man of words. I have problems talking. And you want me to go and talk to the Pharaoh? There's got to be somebody else you can, anybody, or well, almost anybody. Moses, I have foreseen this. You, after meeting with the elders, shall meet up with your brother Aaron. Oh, not that know-it-all. But he shall convey my wishes with you. Yeah, well, I got a problem there, because my brother Aaron never got along with my banker, Hamilton. So we're going to have problems. Moses, that is inconsequential. Okay. We shall deliver our people from the evils of the Pharaoh. All right. You shall go forth to deliver our people to the land of milk and honey. On the way back to Egypt, God reminded Moses of all God had promised to do. God fulfilled one promise by sending Moses' brother Aaron into the wilderness to meet Moses and his family. There, Moses shared all that God had said to him.
Aaron and Moses went into Egypt. They called the Israelite people together. Aaron spoke the promises of God. Moses performed the signs God gave him. The Israelite people believed that God had spoken and that God had called Moses and Aaron to lead them out of slavery. The people fell to their knees and worshipped God, like Jacob and his sons had many generations before. Dave would like me to read it instead, if that's okay. <laughs> that's perfectly fine. Okay. Uh, so Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Want to do this part? Mm -hmm. Then he said to the servant, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corner, and I invite you to the banquet. Anyone you find. So the servant went out to the in out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the the bad as well as the good. And wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to be the guests, he noticed a man that was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here with the wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. And the king told the attendant, tie him and put and throw him outside and see the darkness while there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Thank you. So I want to start this morning with a story that someone who was not a parishioner gave me permission to tell. And it's the story of why he was not my parishioner and actually never a parishioner of any church after the time that he was 12. His name was Simon. And Simon had a very hard life. He grew up at the very beginning of the depression and his family was incredibly poor. They were sharecroppers and um, just didn't have very much at all. He was living in hand-me-downs from cousins. He was living in a house that had no real access to water easily because their pump often ran dry to their well. And his mother died when he was nine. His father remarried when he was 12 and they moved. So he was uprooted from everything that he had known in his little village, the church that he had been going to where everybody was in the same boat the school that he had been going to where all the kids were, as he put it, as rat-tailed as I was. And they moved to a small town. And the town was not wealthy by anybody's standards today, but it was a definite step up from where he had been living before. When he and his father moved in with his new stepmother, there still wasn't a lot of money. And so... Simon got new Sunday clothes, but they were certainly not new. They were just new to him and they were still bedraggled and still a little bit ratty at the hems and whatnot of his pants. Um, he thought he looked like a million dollars because they were the nicest clothes he'd ever had. So Simon very proudly went to his new church the next Sunday morning and when he walked in with his father, the pastor looked at the two of them, his father, a 
towering man um, and Simon, a budding, you know, 12 year old adolescent boy. The pastor said to them, if this is the best you have to offer God, it's not good enough. You are not welcome here dressed the way that you are. When Simon told me this story, his eyes were filled with tears. And at the time he was in his late 80s. He said, I haven't set foot in a church since except to marry my wife because a pastor made me feel like I wasn't good enough for God. And it made me think of this parable when he was telling that story because of the end of the story. You know, here's this man who comes because he's basically been dragged off the street and he gets thrown out because he's not dressed for a wedding. Oh, that's a little tough to take. And we know that Jesus' purpose in telling the parable was to remind people that they needed to be ready always for the coming of the king. But there's many, many layers to this parable. And what I love about it is that it speaks to the necessity of connections. If we go back to the beginning of the parable, the king issued the invitation for the wedding banquet and we assume from the beginning of it that everybody who received an invitation was at least moderately excited. But by the time the call came for the actual banquet, everybody was sort of like, eh, I got better things to do. I got a Zoom meeting. I got, you know, gardening to do. I've got dishes to wash. And you have to wonder how much attention the king had paid to those relationships. It seems like the connections were broken because people weren't really invested in coming to help him celebrate. So the king reaches out to people who have a connection to him because of power. You no, know, he calls for anybody and everybody to come to the banquet and it's a command. So people come, but they come because they're commanded to. They come because they're fearful. And so that's a broken connection too. You, know, you don't ever wanna go somewhere because you're afraid not to. And then there's this one man who didn't get the memo to be ready for an invitation to a wedding banquet that he never thought he would be invited to who gets there and gets chastised and gets thrown out on his ear and essentially gets cast into hell where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's the garbage pits of Gehenna, which are below the walls of Jerusalem that history tells us were always on fire. So if we think about this parable and what it teaches us as a church, I think there's a lot to say about the connections that we as a church need to nurture. And they start right in our own house, right? You know, we need to be connected to each other. We need to be checking in on each other and reaching out to each other, especially right now when we can't necessarily see each other in person except in very small groups. But even when we go back to what resembles the old times, the before times, when we're able to gather in worship, there are still gonna be people who can't come to worship. And maybe it won't be because of COVID, maybe it will be because they're in a place in their lives where they can't physically get out of their homes or they're at a point in their lives where getting there is really hard, where they love nothing more than to answer the invitation, but, it's just too much. Or maybe they've moved out of the area and maybe, you know, they haven't found a church home yet, but it's too far to come to be with us. So how do we nurture those connections? How do we keep building that, keep them at the table, I should say. And then the next question is, how do we build a bigger table? How do we build connections beyond the people who are already here? 
And some of that is done through the food pantry. But I dare say that there aren't very many people who come to the food pantry who know that they would be welcome in the sanctuary when we resume in-person worship with a full crew and no limits. I dare say that there are many people who are coming to the food pantry who are lucky to have enough connections to get their kids online for hybrid learning or who maybe if they're older people don't even have a way to get on to Zoom. But how could we reach out to them? How could we build the table bigger so that they could join us some way? And there's connections beyond the folks there too. How do we reach out and build connections with other organizations in the area? We have things coming up that may or may not happen on Veterans Day. But what other agencies are out there? What other groups are out there that we could build the table bigger so that more people would know that they're welcome, not just here, but at the table that is God's, whether it's the section reserved for the Congregational Church of Mansfield or not. And of course, we have to nurture the connections within the denomination as well. The old colony association, how are we connected to that? I mean, you know, as it happens, my standing is an old colony and this is an old colony church, but who do we have that's paying attention to what's happening in the association? Did you know that there's a Southeast area meeting on the 15th of November, that's a Zoom meeting? And it's very likely that our choir is gonna be asked to kind of lead the charge for an acapella version of, of a hymn or two or an anthem for um, the worship service. Why is that? Because we're the only ones doing that kind of thing right now. But we have a gift to offer and we have a gift to invite people to share in. There's the Southern New England Conference. You know, what's going on in the Southern New England Conference and do we know about that? You know, have you read about the new executive minister have you read the job description for the new executive minister, which seems to be this kind of nebulous thing of he's going to make us all figure out what the vision is and then live into the vision. The cool thing about it is he's a really fun guy to be around. And I think that Darrell Goodwin is going to really do some amazing things. But in order to be a part of that, we've got to be at that table. And that means joining our table to the table of our sister churches all throughout Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. And there's even a couple of churches in New York. And I think there's a couple of churches in Vermont too that are part of the Southern New England Conference, just the way that association lines are, are drawn. And beyond even the UCC, what are our partnerships with other churches? We do help with the soup kitchen we're part of the Attleboro area in our faith coalition. And how are we nurturing that connection to the churches and the synagogue and the temple, the mosque there? So these connections are all really important. And I think for us in this particular time, the bigger we make the table, the less messy humanity is going to be because at the table, we have the opportunity to sit and talk with each other and to talk with people who aren't like us and to hear their stories. So that if somebody who isn't like us comes to the door of the sanctuary and wants to be let in, it won't be a, oh, you're not dressed appropriately. It will be welcome come join the circle. So Kim, if you can stop sharing your screen for a moment. And if everybody can go to the grid view, which is probably up in the right hand corner, it's either the right hand corner or the left hand bottom corner. And with as many people as are in the rooms, and if you're in a room with two people, hold your hand, hold hands together and hold them up. And put your hands inside the screen and then reach out. 
And let's hold hands in this weird virtual way. And if you're on the telephone, know that we're holding your hands too, even though you can't see it. And let's remember that the circle has places for lots more people. And let's build a bigger table that we can all be a part of. In this interim time, let's figure out what connections need to be nurtured and strengthen them so that when your next pastor comes, the table is big and getting bigger with every invitation to someone to come in and join the banquet. Alleluia, amen. All right, Kim, you can share your screen again. So as we enter our time of prayer this morning, we are continuing to pray for all those whose lives have been affected by COVID in any way, shape, or form. Um, I know that hospitals in Massachusetts had very cautiously started to allow one visitor, perhaps two visitors per patient, and many of them have stopped that practice now um, as case counts are rising. So we want to be particularly attentive to that. Um, we continue to hold in prayer those who have been affected by the wildfires in the West and also um, the Louisiana coastline that has now had its fourth big storm this year. Um, Delta and the flooding has continued there and there's going to be rain all the way up through the middle of the country or the eastern half of the middle of the country um, over the next few days. And they're saying that some of that could be pretty heavy. We ask for compassion, wisdom, and hope for the whole people of God, and especially here in the United States. And we continue to pray for faculty and staff and students and parents who are wondering when the next change is gonna happen. We think about all those who are under treatment for things that are not COVID-19 because their treatment has been affected by the pandemic in one way or another. And also from the Ironmans, um, a prayer request for the Daly family. And I will just add for all those whose grief is fresh this week. Are there other prayers to be added? in the chat. Emily asks for prayers for her friend Vera, who's recovering from a breast reconstruction after a double mastectomy. Oh, and Tyler has a relative who's has a brain bleed and who is in the hospital. We definitely pray for Vera and for Tyler's relative. Oh. And Carol asks for prayers for friends and family of one who just died by suicide. Let us go to God in prayer. Holy God, you call us to love and care for one another. 
It is not always a burning bush that gets our attention. Sometimes it is simply being aware of the pain and grief of people that we know and care about that spurs us to care more for everyone. It seems as in this year we have had to pour out more love and more care for more people than ever before. Many of us are exhausted from navigating this strange time. And we wonder how it is that we can keep relying upon you and ask, don't you get tired of this too? And yet, every time we turn to you, there you are steadfast, loving, comforting. And so we pour our hearts out to you for everything we have named here and for so much more that is in our hearts that we can't find the words to express. And we give it to you we ask that you take it from us, not so that we don't have to care anymore, but so that we can care better, so that we can be more attentive to the connections that we already have and be open to the opportunities to make connections so that the table of people who know you and love you and serve you can be ever bigger. We know your love and we ask that you help us to show it to each person that we meet so that they too might come to know you and to be sustained by your steadfast and everlasting love. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And now let us bless each other as we leave the time of worship and enter our time of fellowship. Go on your way in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help and cheer the sick. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord. Be well. Be safe. Be strong. And may the blessing of God be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen.